I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we offer our thanks for this day, for the opportunity that we have to worship, for the privilege and the gift of Scripture. And so as we read it, we pray that by your Holy Spirit it may become for us a living word, a word that captures our imagination, but more, renews our calling as disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Listen to scripture as I read it to you from the prophet Jeremiah. This is from the 29th verse. The prophet is addressing the exiles or those who have been taken into the Babylonian captivity. They have been there for a few years. Many are hoping to go home. But the message that Jeremiah, underneath that message that he has to offer them, is that they will be there for two generations. And so this is his word of hope for them. Listen. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek this, the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Question. If you could live in any time in history and any place, where would you like to be? Where would you like to be? It's an interesting and revealing discussion to have, perhaps at a dinner table. Some people respond in many different ways. They'd like to live in Philadelphia in 1776, particularly in July, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Others have said, well, no, I'd like to be in Jerusalem. I'd like to be there on that Sunday when Jesus rode into town on the colt. The colt. Others of people have said, no, for me, it's the 1800s in the Old West. That's where I'd like to be. Others have said, no, if I could be anywhere, any place, any time, it would be in ancient Greece with the philosophers, Aristotle and Plato, hearing these great minds at work. If you could live at any time in history and in any place, where would you choose? Where would you be and when? I wonder if any of us would choose Poland in 2016. Would it even come to mind? My guess is that most of us would probably choose a different time and place. You know, perhaps we have an image of an easier life, a more exciting life, a more interesting one. <clears throat> would any of us pick Poland, Ohio in 2016? Well, the reality is we are here and it is now with all its faults, with all its challenges, with all its Im the improvements that could make, with all the wonderful things about this community, this is where we are, and we are here right now. And so the question is, how should we live? I think this is the challenge that Jeremiah addresses in his text from, from, uh, you know, to the exiles. The prophet was speaking to a large group of people who basically wanted to be somewhere else. They wanted to live at a different time in history. 
They wanted to turn the clock back, perhaps, to when things were just a little bit better, or at least they thought they were. This morning, I'd like to examine the context of Jeremiah's message, and then our own context, and then conclude by addressing this question, how are Christians, how are you and how are we, to live when we feel trapped by time, by chance, and by circumstance? Well, first, Jeremiah was not addressing a very happy group of people. You know, his message was for Jewish people who were carted off against their will to Babylon. <laughs> they were taken from homes. They were taken from their comfortable routines. They, but most importantly, they were taken from the center of their faith. You see, Jerusalem was the home of the temple. And the temple was where God, their God, Yahweh, existed. That's where his home was. And they were removed from the source of their faith. Can you imagine the pain, the grief of a people who are not only torn from their homeland, but also from their God? Psalm 137 speaks of their sorrow, and it does it in such a beautiful poetic way. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. We wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked for a song. How could we sing the Lord's song in a strange and foreign land? How could they sing to God? How could they sing about God when they were away from their temple, when they were away from the holy city? How could they worship God and sing songs of joy in this strange land with strange customs and a strange language? How could they sing with joy and earnest when they were experiencing a foreign, alien way of life. The Jews in captivity in Babylon desired a message of hope. They desperately wanted to hear something that would give them a reason to live. And Jeremiah knew that the people would be in captivity for a long, long time, for generations. You know, they thought they would get out after a couple years. But the prophet Jeremiah knew differently. And consequently, what is his message? They should build houses, they should plant gardens, they should start their families, because you're going to be there for two generations, 40 years. Make the best of it, folks. And I love this passage. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. God, the Lord of the temple, was with them, even in a foreign land. But this message was not only a word of hope to the Jews in, exiles, in exile, it would become a paradigm for Judaism for nearly 25 centuries, right up to today. You know, as the Jewish people were scattered throughout the globe, they survived. They were resilient. Why? Because they sought the welfare of the city, of the place where they found themselves. In short, they bloomed where they were planted. They knew that in its welfare, they would find their own welfare and their life's purpose. Their religion, which was formerly focused on one place, the temple, now was spread throughout the world just as they were. And they would thrive. They would thrive in the worlds outside of Jerusalem. Our context is different than the people of Judah during the Babylonian captivity. We have not been removed from our homes, and none of us is about to be dragged off to Canada. At least I don't think so. And yet there's a sense, I think, on the part of many of us that we are truly aliens living in a strange and foreign land it's changing on us, and we feel as though we're not at home. 
We may not be captives in Babylon, but we find ourselves prisoners at times in a life that pulls us away from the center of our being. Captives, perhaps, to a life that lacks meaning. Captives to a life that just doesn't satisfy. Captives to living where we'd rather not be or at a time where we'd rather not be living in. Captives to believing that there might be or there should be something more to life or it should be just a little bit easier than it is. Captives deprived of some hopeful future. Captives pulled by life's circumstances away from a life that gives meaning and hope. Alienated from God. So far away. We may be far from Babylon in the seventh century before Christ, but many today are captives claimed by circumstances, victims to time and chance, living without hope. And so we too find ourselves raising our voices with the ancient people of Judah. How shall we, how shall we sing the Lord's song in this strange and alien land? Our modern Babylon takes many different forms. It may be, we may be captive to illness or injury. How do you sing the Lord's song from a hospital bed? We may be captive in our professions, in our life's calling. It may take the form of unemployment, underemployment, or just work that lacks joy and purpose. How do we sing the Lord's song at a job we hate, or worse yet, without a job. We may be captive to an alien land of habit and addiction. You know, this is the insidious power that controls us and it seems so much greater than we are. These powers direct our lives and we soon become enslaved to them. How do we sing the Lord's song when we have surrendered the control of our life to something that is so alien to our being? We may be captive to our cultural obsession with consumption. Now, this is the emptiness that seems to pervade the 21st century. It is what the poets of a previous generation called the wasteland of the spirit. Now, something, seem, something important seems to be missing in our lives, and so we try to fill it. We fill it with things and more things and more things. And yet the emptiness lingers. How do we sing the Lord's song in a land of plenty where we still feel lacking? We may not be captives in Babylon with the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. I think but each of us is intimate with our own modern captor. And we cry out through our tears that old lament. How shall we sing the Lord's song in this strange and alien existence? We often, we are often not where we want to be. And we feel that God does not speak to us. But God does. God does. And it's a strange message when we first hear it. The message is build houses, live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters. Seek the welfare of the place where I have put you. For in its welfare, you will find welfare. In other words, live fully in the world where you find yourselves. Bloom where you are planted. My father, spent the last two weeks of his life under hospice care in a nursing facility on the eastern shore of Maryland. I went down to visit him, stayed in his room with him for an extended period of time. He had an orderly who was entrusted with his personal care. I got to know this man a little better during that time there. The man was in his late 40s, perhaps 50, he spoke English with a thick accent that betrayed a Middle Eastern background. The large cross that hung from his neck indicated that he was indeed a Christian. 
I can say this, that whatever joy and comfort my father experienced in his last days came from his interactions with this individual. The tasks were not pleasant, taking care of hygienic needs, feeding, moving my father around, and yet this individual did it with a sense of joy and purpose, whistling and even singing. He was there in that room to bring healing and hope to one who was dying. I would show up in the morning to see my father, and this orderly would greet me with a big smile, an open hand, and as things became grimmer, a huge hug. I was happy that he was there with my father, but I was also happy he was there for me. It was only later that I learned about this individual's story. He was from a Middle Eastern country that was in political ferment. And as a Christian, he left with his family to escape persecution and death. When he came here, the one job that he could find to support his family was working as an aide in a nursing facility, doing the menial tasks of that position. I learned that he was a physician in his former country. He was a specialist. He enjoyed the prestige and comfort of that position. But of course, the credentials don't always transfer. And circumstances took that away from him. But here's the thing. He was not a captive. He was not where he wanted to be, perhaps. He was not doing what he wanted to do. But somehow he knew that this is where God had placed him. And he sought the welfare of the place where he was and thus found his own welfare, joy, happiness, and purpose. He built, he planted, and he sought. I will add, he comforted. And thus found his own welfare, joy, and happiness. He sung the Lord's song in the halls of that nursing facility. He sung it in his attitude, in his demeanor, in the way he walked, and the care that he brought in those routine tasks that he performed. He brought it in the comfort that he brought to the dying. Build, plant, and seek. If you could live at any time in history, in any place, where would you like to be and when? It's enjoyable speculation. Do that around the table later. But we live here, and we live now, in 2016. The good news is that we are called to build, plant, and seek God and the welfare of others here and now. And in doing so, we find our hearts singing a joyous song, singing the Lord's song, in this sometimes strange and alien land. But we are free. Amen.